So basically with this Young Scholars in Turkey program, we intend to provide young, young social scientists like Sardar Poyraz uh, a venue to present their uh, original academic research uh, in DC and get as much feedback as they could get from a different audience, a different audience than they are used to. You know. uh, our meetings will include, like, uh, like in addition to academics, we are going to have journalists, uh, policy makers, etc. So we want to facilitate a dialogue and exchange of ideas between uh, young researchers uh, who have a research agenda on Turkey in various academic institutions uh, and research centers. And we also aim to contribute to diversify voices and analytical, <coughs> analytical perspectives on Turkey. Uh, Turkey-related issues in a wide area of disciplines like political science, history, uh, sociology, and conflict resolution, etc. So our uh, second guest today is Sardar Poyraz, a former colleague of mine, actually. Uh, he has published on history of Turkey, uh, Ottoman history, Ottoman Empire, and taught classes on modern modern Middle Eastern history and world history at the Ohio State University and Lake Forest University. He worked as a graduate research associate at the Ohio State's Merchant Center for International Security Studies. He received his BA Magda uh, Kumwode in international relations from Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey, and his MA in political science from uh, Ohio State University. He also studied at the Khoda University Institute in Tehran, Iran, and he is currently finishing his PhD studies in Middle Eastern history at the Ohio State University. And he will teach as a visiting assistant professor at the University of Montana next year. His uh, research languages include modern Turkish, Ottoman, and Persian. So we're going to have a <laughs> Uh, a presentation that, that gives us a gist of uh, his dissertation topic. Uh, and I'm going to stop here and uh, let Sergar uh, begin this, this talk on, on this interesting topic. Right. You have around 20 minutes. Okay. Maybe you could remind me, you know. Okay, I'll do it. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Uh, I think in 20 minutes I will only be able to you know, present your theory frame of my, 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 my dissertation, my studies. And if you would like to more, talk more about the critical side of the study, I'm, you know, I'm more than glad to do that. Perhaps in the question and answer session. That's it. That's beginning. At least since the publication of Bernard Lewis's The Emergence of Modern Turkey, Ottoman and Turkish studies have been obsessed with the idea of an almost Manichaean struggle between modernity and tradition. According to Lewis, the growth of the sentiments of Turkish identity was connected with the movement away from Islamic practice and tradition and towards Europe. This began with purely practical short-term measures of reform intended to accomplish a limited purpose. It developed into a large-scale, deliberate attempt to take a whole nation across the frontier from one civilization to another. It's a quote from Lewis. Uh, sociologists such as S.N. Eisenstadt have argued that the classical theories of modernization linking structural economic variables, such as the advent of consumer capitalism and industrialization to a host of socio-political variables, like the advent of democracy, the decline of the traditional beliefs, and increasing secularization are exhausted. In order to drive his point home, Eisenstadt gave references to the theories of end of history and the clash of civilization, in which Western civilization, the seeming epitome of modernity, is confronted by a world in which traditional fundamentals anti-modern and anti-Western civilizations, some 
most notably Islamic, weaving the West with enemies or disdain, are predominant. Although I agree with Einstein on the general point of the expulsion of the modernization theory, I do not believe that the alternatives to this theory should be thought among Huntington-style doomsday scenarios. In fact, my study of the ideas of such so-called conservative and traditional thinkers, as Stefan Nazar, Ahmed Hilmi, and Bediouz Zaman Said Nursi, both of them late Ottoman, early Turkish public thinkers, and the responses they gave to the overtly Western ideas proposed by a generation of Ottoman materials who were under the spell of German vulgar materialism of the 19th century convinced me that we need to replace the earlier theoretical framework of modernization theory with a novel theoretical approach, emphasizing the radically different ways in which the ideas of a Western culture and modernity were perceived and appropriated by different segments of the Ottoman and Turkish intelligentsia. My theoretical approach thus deliberately downplays the struggle of modernity and tradition, as well as the struggle of the West and the East. I can give the real concepts have run their course and, 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 no longer useful, and they are no longer useful for understanding Ottoman and Turkish history. In my opinion, the discussion among the intellectuals of the late Ottoman and early Republican period was not about modernity on the one hand versus tradition on the other. It was about the proper strategy for the appropriation of modernity in a non-European setting. So, I argue that in their own way, both the so-called Western, you know, Batsajilari in Turkey, such as Mif Pasha, Beşikspal, and Bahatefi, for example, as well as their conservative critics, such as Şeyh Bender, Zad Ahmet Hilmi, Bediü Zaman Said Nursi, Mehmet Akif Ersoy, Said Ali Pasha, and others, were to a large extent modern and pro -Western. The difference among people such as Western, such as Abdullah Cedet and Bahatefi, on the one hand, and Sheikh Pender Azad Ahmed Ibn Bediz Zaman Said Nursi, Mehmed Ali Fersen, and Ahmed Ahmed Abdullah, on the other hand, was that whereas Abdullah Cedet and Bahatifi, that is the Westerns, argued for the adoption of Western modernity in total, the second group of intellectuals made a crucial distinction between the material and spiritual sides of Western modernity. Whereas the second group of intellectuals were eager to adopt the material side of Western modernity, including not only the military and economic structures, but also governmental and political structures, all the West, Western democracy, parliamentary democracy, and so on. They had serious reservations when it came to adopting European modes of interpersonal behavior, morality, ahlak in Turkish, and modern European attitudes concerning religion. It may be argued that this second group of intellectuals was trying to create a language of cultural authenticity in the face of an apparent need for change and modernization. In other words, Although they wanted to modernize, they wanted to modernize on their own terms. The modern triumph of <coughs> Nursi and Hilmi and others argue was a strictly material affair, having they are with almost nothing to do with European moral or ethical superiority. In the moral, religious, and spiritual realm, they continue to believe in the value of their own culture. Such intellectuals as Bahatefi, Ahmed Nebin, Abdullah Shed, and others, on the other hand, interpreted the apparent triumph of Europe over the Ottomans and the rest of the world, for that matter, rather differently, and argued for the necessity of a radical change in the moral realm as well. Very it was possible for Nursi and Hilmi and Erso, let's say, to selectively adopt the material advancements associated with you and utilize, if that is the correct term here, these material factors in their society. Such a selective cultural adoption was impossible for Abdullah Cedet, Bahatefi, and the pure references. According to Abdullah Cedet and Bahatefi, the European triumph was not only a political, economic, and material affair. It was at least partly a moral affair as well. That is one of the reasons why they were much more radical in their programs of modernity and argued for a comprehensible cultural and social change than Hilmi and Nursi, let's say, whose visions of modernity remain, in many important respects, for the lack of a better world, Islam. I need to emphasize here, however, that all of these intellectuals share the common language, which may be described as defensive developmentalism, uh, described by James Galvin, among others, as a process through which these intellectuals aim 
to strengthen their states 